And the fifth angel sounded, and they saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit. And there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. Suddenly, as the fifth angel trumpeted, John noticed a star that had earlier fallen from heaven, watching. He saw the fallen star, a fallen angel really, receive the key of the shaft of the bottomless pit. As the fallen angel made use of the key, thick clouds billowed from the bottomless pit like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air grew dark. Peering anxiously into the fearsome murk, John was startled by a swarm of flying locusts, not ordinary insects. These locusts seemed to have human faces and to be wearing crowns of gold above their women's hair. They came on aggressively like horses arrayed for battle. Ordinary locusts don't sting, but these locusts seem to have tails like scorpions. Scorpions sting with their tails, very painfully, but not often fatally. They were told to torture people, with the notable exception of people who had the seal of God. Ordinary locusts die quickly without food, but even though these locusts, like Joel's, had lion's teeth, they were apparently forbidden to eat anything for five months. Quite unlocust like these astonishing insects had a king in charge of them. Their king was the angel of the bottomless pit. His name was Abaddon in Hebrew, Apollyon in Greek, and in English meant destroyer. See Revelation chapter 9 verses 1 through 11. John's vision didn't cease. A sixth trumpet, the second woe, followed right after the fifth trumpet, the first woe that we have just been talking about. As John listened, a voice from the golden altar in the heavenly sanctuary ordered the release of the four angels who were bound at the great river Euphrates. The voice presumably came from the same angel of fire and altar we were introduced to in the sanctuary vision. The four angels he spoke about had been held ready for the hour, the day, the month, and the year to kill a third of mankind. Suddenly the four angels were exchanged on John's visionary screen for an almost incomprehensibly immense army of 200 million riders on horseback. Their number was twice as large as the number of angels gathered around the throne in Revelation chapter 5 verse 11. As their seemingly endless array advanced menacingly into view, John observed that the riders seemed to be wearing red, blue, and yellow breastplates, the color of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur. They were a murderous multitude, massacring a third of mankind with the fire and smoke and sulfur that seemed to pour out of their horses' mouths. The last three trumpets are also called the three woes. Why? Because they were even more terrible than the four before them. And also, they were different because a new religion is here introduced into the world. A religion of darkness, almost the exact opposite to the teachings of Jesus. The ravages of these warriors of Islam were to be seen in the woes of the last three trumpets. The western part of the former Roman Empire has been brought down in the first four trumpets. There is no emperor on the throne in the city of Rome anymore. Instead, the Bishop of Rome sits on the throne and rules over both the church and the government. So now the fifth and sixth trumpets bring attacks on the eastern part, where there is still a Roman emperor ruling. By the end of the sixth trumpet, the eastern Roman empire is destroyed completely also. The word woe or woe here is a cry of sorrow. The evil ways of men bring suffering and misery on themselves and others. Only in loving and obeying Jesus is real joy to be found. If you look back at the first chapter of Revelation, you will see there that Jesus had seven stars in his hand and we learned that these were messengers to the churches. Here we see a fallen star, a religious messenger, but a fallen or false one. He has a key to turn something loose on the earth. This is a key of circumstances. Long wars in other areas of the world allowed the development of this dark power. Here we see him open up a pit and smoke comes out so thick that the sun and air is made dark. Now remember these are all symbols, so what does it mean? This is telling us about when the religion of Islam was invented by the man that claimed to be a prophet. His name was Muhammad, and though he could not write, his teachings were remembered and written down by others, and later, after he died, these bits and pieces were gathered together into a new Bible called the Quran. 
The bottomless pit here can mean the dark and evil elements of the world, or any wild and desolate area. Islam poured upon the world from the desert lands of Arabia. Just as the gospel of Jesus is well described as light to the world, this religion is well described as darkness. Jesus taught us to seek peace and love our enemies. This darkness teaches men that war and killing their enemies is the highest and best thing they can do for their God. Christianity was never to be forced on people. God can only accept willing service. But Muhammad taught that all should be forced to obey his religion or they should be killed. These people were taught that to die in battle while forcing people to worship Allah, as they called their God, and follow Muhammad was the best thing they could ever do. They were told that they then go straight to a wonderful place where they would have all kinds of beautiful women, wine to drink, and fancy food to eat forever. So they were happy to make war and didn't mind getting killed fighting for their faith. This smoke made it almost impossible for people taught like this to see the light of Jesus' gospel or breathe the pure air of Bible truth. Jesus longs to have these people who are blinded by the smoke to come to him and be saved. The language used here is highly figurative. The star seems to suggest the appearance of a false religious teacher. This star, which had previously fallen from heaven under the third trumpet in Revelation chapter 8 verses 10 and 11, the king called Abaddon, Apollyon, or Destroyer. It's obviously Satan, working through his messenger, Muhammad, and Islamic teachers and caliphs. The term bottomless pit refers to a place of emptiness such as a desert. That which proceeded from the pit appeared to have a darkening effect such as would be expected from large clouds of smoke. The locusts of the fifth trumpet flew out of dark smoke that arose from the bottomless pit. The darkness we may believe represents here, as under the fourth trumpet, erroneous teachings that veiled or denied the truth about God and about Jesus Christ. We think of the Quran. Bottomless pit is translated from abusos, abyss, a Greek word meaning immeasurable or boundless. Abusos is a name for the ocean in the Greek translation of Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 and for the grave in Psalms 71 verse 20. The ocean's depth was unmeasurable in ancient times and the grave's appetite for dead bodies was boundless then and remained so. In Revelation, Abusos is impressionistic. The utter deadness of the grave aptly symbolizes the vast deserts of Arabia, the home of Muhammad, great sweeps of which are still totally uninhabitable. Here we see two more symbols that make us think of the desert. The locusts that would come out of the deserts at certain times and eat up all the crops, and the scorpion, a nasty, poisonous creature, like a long-tailed spider with a sting, that would strike with the sting in his tail and it would really hurt. And the locusts were given enough power so that their appearance brought about much devastation. The invasion pictured here came from Arabia, a desert country. Near the close of the 6th century, Muhammad was born in Mecca. As he grew into manhood, he claimed to be a direct descendant of Abraham through Ishmael, Abraham's son by Hagar, Sarah's maid. For a month each year, he went to a cave just outside of Mecca where he fasted and prayed. On one occasion, as he returned from a month of seclusion, he announced his belief in one God and he further revealed that he was a prophet. Islam is a religion of works. Muhammad asked his followers to do three things, pray, fast, and give alms. They had one rule of action in spreading this new religion. They said, confess there is only one God and that Muhammad is his prophet. Pay tribute or choose death. They rejected with contempt the atoning blood of Christ. They believed Jesus to be a prophet like Moses, but inferior to Muhammad. In the West, the papacy was developing and exalting its system of works, while in the East, this new religion of Islam was doing the same thing. The religion of Muhammad became the motivating force that unlocked these dwellers of the desert and sent them forth on their mission of devastation. This prophecy of the conquest of the Arabs and their new religion indicated that they were only to torment the empire in the East. God who knows and who is in control of the future announced before it ever came into existence the lit the time this power would carry on its evasions. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion, when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads were as it were the crowns like gold. And their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women. 
and their teeth were as the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates, as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle, and they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. That's verses 4 through 11. Those things which literal locusts hurt and devour, these symbolic locusts were commanded not to hurt. God is always concerned with the safety of his faithful and loyal servants. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him, and delivereth them. Psalm 34, 7. Theirs was a mission against idolaters and image worshippers, but they were to spare those who remained true to God. Our symbolic locusts were forbidden to eat anything green or to hurt persons who had the seal of God. We saw that green grass stands for people of God. We have already observed that Islam granted Jews and Christians a good many liberties as people of the book. Notably, Sabbath keeping Christians survived in Armenia and Ethiopia. Seal of God in their foreheads. In remarks upon Revelation chapter 7 verses 1 through 3, we have shown that the seal of God is the Sabbath of the fourth commandment. History is not silent upon the fact that there have been observers of the true seventh day Sabbath all through the gospel age. In Revelation 7, the seal of God is shown implanted in the foreheads of God's people in the last days in order to protect them from the judgments of God. The scripture clearly reveals that the seal of God refers to the Sabbath of the fourth commandment, protect Sabbath keepers. Did the arrows protect those who were observers of the seventh day Sabbath of the fourth commandment? Notice the record given by Dr. B.G. Wilkinson in his study of the rise and spread of the early Christian faith. He gives some remarkable information concerning this period of church history. In the early centuries of the Christian era, the Church of the East, not the Western or Latin Church, sometimes called the Assyrian Church, sometimes the Nestorian Church, who were observers of the true Sabbath, very effectively spread throughout Asia and the East, but remained separate from the Church in the West, especially the apostasy. These true Christians became the teachers of the Arabs and were responsible for establishing an educational system in Syria, Mesopotamia, Turkestan, Tibet, China, India, Ceylon, and other areas. The Arabs, like the Persians, were very partial to the Syrian Christians because they found it necessary in the early days of their power to lean upon the splendid schools which this church had developed. Medicine made great progress in the hands of the Church of the East. The Arabian court and its extended administrations employed its members as secretaries and imperial representatives. Assyrian Christians suffered comparatively little at the hands of the Muslims, but later much more so at the hands of the Jesuits. The leader of the Church of the East, sensing that the conquest of the Persian Empire was imminent, succeeded in obtaining a pledge of protection and freedom of worship on condition that the Christians paid certain tribute. These immunities extended by Abu Bakr were not only confirmed by Omar, his successor, but even the taxes were remitted. When the Arabian Empire was fully established, it built up Baghdad, its magnificent new capital, the Church of the East, removed its spiritual capital from Seleucia to Baghdad, where it remained for approximately the next 500 years. This is a significant fulfillment of this aspect of the fifth trumpet prophecy. Edward Gibbon confirms Wilkinson's statement. To his Christian subjects, meaning the true Christians, not the apostates whom the Arabs tormented, Muhammad readily granted the security of their persons, the freedom of their trade, the property of their goods, and the toleration of their worship. The Arab power was to torment but not kill. This indicated that the Eastern Empire would be oppressed with bitter torments but not subdued. The scorpion sting suggests a false religion which was as the poison of a serpent. Why does the Bible say that during this period many would desire death rather than life but would not be able to find it? This was because these Arabs were constantly engaged in tormenting people all through the empire. On many occasions they attacked Constantinople but were driven back each time. This power tormented the Eastern Roman Empire but did not manage to destroy it completely. So the verse says they should not kill them. Notice the five months. This is prophetic time. So a day equals a real year. This means for 150 years this force would be coming out of the deserts and striking the eastern part of the former Roman Empire. This time started in July 27, 1299, so the 150 years reached to 1449. Muslims, of course, started long before that, but this five months was when they had a king over them. The tormenting power of these raiders made life a burden for the Eastern Empire, who were getting attacked by them. They would rather have been conquered by them and thus stopped the torment. 
Because of a plot to assassinate Muhammad in 622, he fled from Mecca to Yertrib. He gave this city another name meaning it was the city of the prophet or Medina. Muhammad's fortunes now rose, but his character degenerated. He had borne adversity and opposition with sublime faith and patience, but was not able to bear prosperity so well. He now became a politician, the head of a party, contriving expedients for its success. Hitherto, truth was his only weapon. Thenceforth, force constituted his chief means. He no longer sought to convince his antagonists, but endeavored to force their submission by the terror of his power. The tone of his revelations changed, adapting themselves to his necessity. And he claimed inspiration for every action, even for taking an additional wife. He no longer contented himself with the arts of persuasion, but assumed a tone of command. He declared that the period of long suffering and patience was past, and that his mission and that of every Muslim was to provocate the dominion of Islam by the sword. The duty of all Muslims was to destroy the temples of the infidels, to overthrow the idols, and to pursue the unbelievers to the remotest quarters of the world. Israel Smith Clare, The Standard History of the World, Volume 4, page 1779. After Muhammad's death at the age of 62 on June 8, 632, his successor, Abu Bakr, appealed to the followers of Muhammad by saying, Remember that you are always in the presence of Allah, always at the point of death, always in expectation of judgment, always in hope of paradise. Avoid then injustice and oppression. Study to preserve the love and confidence of your troops. When you fight the battles of Allah, bear yourselves like men and turn not your backs upon the enemy. Let your victories never be sullied by the blood of women or children. Destroy not the fruit trees, neither burn the standing corn. Do no damage to the flocks and herds, nor kill any beasts but such as are necessary to your subsistence. Whatever treaty you make, be faithful to it. Do no damage to the flocks and herds, nor kill any beasts but such as are necessary to your sustenance. Whatever treaty you make, be faithful to it, and let your deeds be according to your words. As you advance into the enemy's country, you will find some religious persons who live retired in monasteries, designing to serve God in that way. Let them alone and neither hurt them nor destroy their houses. But you will find also another sort of men who belong to the synagogue of Satan, who have shaven crowns, cleave their skulls, give them no quarter till they embrace our faith or pay tribute. Israel Smith Clare, The Standard History of the World, page 1814. Additional identifying features of the Muslims and their invasions, which fulfilled the sounding of this woe trumpet, are enumerated in verses 7 through 10. There is a close resemblance of the locusts to horses ready for battle. The crowns like gold were typical of the turbans worn by these people of the desert. Read Ezekiel chapter 23 verse 42. And the description of their faces, hair, and breastplates was typical of the Muslim customs of dress and warfare. Here we have a description of what these desert warriors were like. It talks about their battle horses. The Arabian desert horses were amazing animals. They were raised by their owners in the tents right along with the family and were treated with gentleness. So they were very highly trained. At a word or touch from their master, they would run like the wind into battle or flee away across the sand. The crowns of gold were the yellow turbans these men wore. They had long hair, either braided up or loose, and the teeth of lions meant their fierceness in battle. Again, it talks about many horses running into battle. The Arab warriors did not march in rows or ranks like Greek or Roman soldiers. They swarmed down unto their enemies on their swift horses, almost as quickly as if they were flying. Before the blood soaked into the ground, they were gone again, galloping like the wind, like unto horses. The Arabs took great care in their horses. They were used primarily for battle. The Arabian breed of horse is still famous today. On their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold. The Arabs are noted for their wearing of turbans upon their heads. When Muhammad fled to Medina and was first received as his prince, a turban was unfurled before him to supply the deficiency of standard. Muhammad also says to wear a turban because it is the way of angels. Allwood, Key to Revelation, Volume 1, page 340. The turban was their ornament and boast, and with the wealthier, they were richly embroidered with gold. It is their crown. This is greatly a Muslim trait, and to thus assume the turban would be to show one as a Muslim. Faces were as the faces of men. What distinguishes a face of a man from a woman's face? It is his beard. The beard was a venerable symbol of manhood for the Arabs. The gravity and firmness of the mind is conspicuous in his outward demeanor. His speech is slow, weighty, and concise. He is seldom provoked to laughter. His only gesture is that of stroking his beard.
the venerable symbol of manhood. Gibbon, Decline and Fall, Volume 5, Chapter 50, pages 343, 344. Revelation chapter 9, verse 8. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. Had hair as the hair of women. The thing that distinguishes a woman's hair from a man's is the length. The Arabs had their hair like the hair of women, that is, long in length. Teeth were as the teeth of lions. The teeth of a lion are large and are used with ferocity and fearlessness against their prey. With the great strength of their teeth, they can tear and devour their prey. This is a fitting symbol of the Arabs' ferocity, fearlessness, and strength in devouring their enemies. They had the hair of a woman, but with the character of a lion. Revelation 9.9 9, And they had breastplates, as it were breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots and many horses running to battle. Breastplates of iron. The breastplate was known as a cuirass, made from iron. About the only protection worn by the Arabs was this breastplate. The Arab cavalry were among the first to wear armored plating or chain mail when they went into battle. In Muhammad's second battle, the Battle of Ohud, 624 AD, 700 were armed with cuirasses. And after the defeat of the Jews, their sheep and camels were inherited by the Muslims. 300 cuirasses, 500 pikes, a thousand lances composed the most useful portion of the spoil. Gibbon, Decline and Fall, Volume 5, page 50, pages 386-389. Sound of their wings, many horses running to battle. The sound of a plague of locusts coming is like the sound of many chariots going to battle. It can be heard from a distance. This is a fitting symbol to describe the Arabs' army of cavalry rushing into battle. The Arabs are famous and noted for this type of army. Twice in verses 5 and 10, mention is made of the length of time allotted to the Muslims during which they were to do their tormenting. The literal locusts today come out for a period of five months. They come out in April and go back to rest again in the month of September. It's true in the literal and it's true in the symbolic as well. Because the Muslims came out to conquer and to wage war about the month of April and they would fold up their tents and go home again at the end of September. Whatever booty they had gotten, they pocketed the gains and did not come out to fight again until the following April, exactly like the locusts do. In symbolic prophecy, each day represents one literal year. Using 30 days to the month, this five-month period will equal 150 days. And this would mean that the Muslims were to torment the Eastern Empire for 150 years. What is the significance of the scorpion's tail? The key is found in the writings of Isaiah in the Old Testament. The elder and the honorable, he is the head. The prophet who teaches lies, he is the tale. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 15. The false prophet, the lying prophet, false religion, that is the tale. In other words, the false religion of Muhammad is the tale which tormented human beings. The sting was in the false religion and by it men were tormented for five months. And their power was to hurt men five months. Verse 10. These words denote stress and anguish caused by injustice, mental rather than physical torment. Many commentators in the past have recognized this. Joseph Mead, a lecturer at Oxford University and a great student of the book of Revelation, recognized this truth. Scripture applies the term scorpion to humans. God warned the prophet Ezekiel, You dwell among scorpions. Do not be afraid of their words or dismayed by their looks, though they are a rebellious house. Ezekiel chapter 2 verse 6. Matthew Henry, commenting on this verse, says that it represents the stinging verbal attacks, full of venom and malice, directed by some who were opposed to Ezekiel the prophet. This is how the revelator describes the venomous insults of the Arabs toward the apostate Christians whom they conquered. E.B. Elliot of Cambridge University presents 11 ways in which the Muslim conquerors demonstrated these characteristics in their attitude to apostate Christians. 1. Bitter contempt and hatred was displayed against Christians who were called dogs and infidels. 2. Christians were forced to pay a life redemption tax every year in order to preserve their lives. 3. Christians were compelled to dress differently from their conquerors. 4. Christians were compelled to ride in a humbler mode of transport. 5. Whenever a Muslim entered into their presence, even though he was the meanest of men, Christians were to rise in deference to him. 6. Christians must freely entertain an Arab when required, including allowing sexual relations with their females. The Arabs were notorious for their immorality. 7. Christians were to build no new churches. 8. Christians were to chime no bells in existing churches. 9. Christians were to admit to their church any Arab, no matter how much he scoffed and ridiculed the service, or how frequently he insulted them. 10. 
frequent insults were leveled at Christian women. 11. There were a thousand and other injuries of oppression that wrinkled Christians and made life a burden. The fifth trumpet prophecy states, In those days men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. Verse 6. This was the lot of oppressed Christians and was God's judgment upon apostasy. It was God's response to the prayers of the saints that had ascended to the altar of incense of the heavenly sanctuary where our great high priest ministered before God. Revelation chapter 8 verses 3 through 5. From the death of Muhammad in 632 until the close of the 13th century, the Arabs were a divided people with no central government. But in harmony with verse 11, the time was to come when they would unite with the king over them. The unification of the Muslims was accomplished by Othman, who founded the Ottoman Empire. He invaded Nicomedia on July 27, 1299, according to the historian Gibbon, who says, It was on the 27th of July. In the year 1299 of the Christian era, that Othman first invaded the territory of Nicomedia, and the singular accuracy of the date seems to disclose some foresight of the rapid and destructive growth of the monster. Edward Gibbon, Esquire, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 4, page 379. For the next 150 years, battles were being fought almost constantly between the Ottomans and the Greeks. God has said that this period of hurting and tormenting would continue for 150 years. This prophecy came to an end in 1449. Thus ends the first woe trumpet. With the beginning of the sixth trumpet, or the second woe, the restraint of destruction is lifted preparatory to the complete breakup of the Eastern Empire. Rather significantly, the name of the leader of the bottomless pit is mentioned as being Abaddon, Hebrew, or Polyon, Greek. This means he is a great destroyer. Primarily, this name describes what Satan does. And to be sure, it was Satan's mastermind which led in the development of this false religion. This is just another evidence of the continuance of the great controversy between Christ and Satan as he worked through the Muslims to offer a counterfeit religion called Islam to the inhabitants of the Eastern Empire. And today millions are still bound by its unbiblical teachings. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter.